Hey, fellow traveler, welcome to the Third Eye Awakening podcast, a show where we talk all about spiritual and psychic awakening, magic, the shift from 3D to 5D, star seeds, ascension, multiple timelines, multiple dimensions, the universe, the multiverse, the Akashic records, all the good things. I am your host, Amy Blair, and I'm so glad to have you here with me today. Okay, let's do this. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Third Eye Awakening. I'm super excited to have Mark Steves here with me today to talk about spirituality, esoteric history, cannabis, and I'm sure so much more. I'm sure it's just going to go down a whole bunch of rabbit holy directions. So Mark Steves is the host of the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast, and he's the booker for the Tinfoil Hat podcast, so he's like a low-key celebrity, basically. He's an avid researcher, martial artist, and overall iconoclast. So welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for being here and being willing to share your perspective with all of us. I am honored to be here on Third Eye Awakenings. I can tell you that I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't put a concerted effort into awakening my third eye. So maybe we can get into how that all started today. Yeah, I would love to. So why don't you give us a little, little bit of a background on like, you know, who you are and how you got to be here, how you got to start your podcast. I love the name of your podcast, by the way, and what you do. Sure. So I am (laughs) born in Connecticut. I just live my life, you know, as close as I could to nature. I've always been fascinated with nature, even though I'm not particularly like out in the rural area. I'm, I'm kind of in the suburbs, but Connecticut's woodsy. So I've always had access to uh, natural wild spaces. And I think that really has set the foundation for who I am and everything else kind of blossom from there. Right now, I have the pleasure of working for Sam Tripoli, as well as Alex Sakaris. I'm Sam Tripoli from the Tinfoil Hat podcast and Alex Sakaris of the Skeptico podcast. And I, I mean, I just kind of use my podcasting uh, addiction to use because I just love podcasts so much that I know all of these folks that should be on Sam and Alex's show, you know, so they have me hire or they have me reach out to people like you, Amy. Yeah, it's just a really cool job because it's full of synchronicities and, you know, it's just life. I don't know. I don't have much to say about what I what I've been up to lately because I'm just kind of in transition. I'm going to see Sam perform comedy this weekend in New Jersey, which is exciting. But uh, my podcast really used to be a different podcast it used to be called the bud triangle because my friends and i would sit in a triangle in a room with microphones (laughs) that we all we bought and this was before zoom before covid so we would just sit in a triangle and smoke and i would try to tell them about all of my theories because at that time it was hard to get them to listen to the podcast i was listening to and but they were interested you know they just So we would smoke and talk about this stuff. And as I started podcasting with more people, and then I eventually podcasted with Sam once or twice, I realized I needed to shift the name because I was getting to, I was feeling like it was like a stoner podcast, which is not who I am. I I love weed, but I don't want to be, you know, pigeonholed like that. So I was spending a lot of time with my family because of COVID and I did a podcast with Sam on, on zero and we were talking and he was like, you know, you got to start doing more of your podcasts. I'm like, all right, I will. I took that to heart and I'm spending some time with my family. And I was so excited because I'm like, Oh, you know, Sam just hired me to work as his booker and they're like Sam who who's that like (laughs) right (laughs) you know like they don't know their their favorite comedian is like uh you know Sebastian Maniscalco because he's Italian like that's about (laughs) it you know so so they didn't really get it and this as far as conspiracy and spirituality and all this alternative history stuff I'm into like they've never most of my family like they're they love me and they know I'm smart but I can't get into a conversation with them about this stuff you know So 
I share this really great news with them. And I was a little disappointed at their reaction. And I'm driving home that day. And it just dawns on me, like my family thinks I'm crazy. Like that, that those words just came into my mind. And then the thought of like, oh, Sam thinks you should change your podcast name. It just all hit. And there it was. And it, you know, that's kind of what I'm setting out to do with my podcast is show people like, hey, my family thinks I'm crazy. And isn't that strange? Because look at all the really profound, amazing stuff we're learning from all these great people I'm getting on the show. You know, I, that's yeah. kind of like I want to just prove myself through that, I guess, so to speak. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I totally relate. Like, I don't know if my, if sometimes I wonder, I'm like, does my family actually think I'm crazy? I think probably, but I'm not really sure, but they definitely would have reacted the same way. Like just been like, Oh, good. That's good. Like this doesn't mean anything to me. And I would have been like so pumped if I had gotten a job working with Sam. <laughs> and yeah, I think it's funny. The, the way that we get sort of lumped into like crazy or flaky or hippie or whatever kind of weird category when actually we're like, no, but we're really interacting with life and like deeply trying to understand it. And you guys are just like <laughs> doing the normal thing, like the, really the crazy normal version of life. Yeah. Yeah. I will. And then I actually used to go by hippie Mark, not of my own choosing, but people used to call me hippie Mark because I would, you know, wear these crystal wraps that I made and, and I would have long, long hair. And this was when I was like in college and it kind of dawned on me like, okay, it's great that people respect and identify me with all these interesting things that I'm interested in but it started to feel really fake because people were identifying me as hippie Mark. And then they had all these expectations and it wasn't always a bad thing because some people really enjoyed the idea like, Oh, here's this guy that knows all this stuff, you know, but the idea that you're kind of becoming a stereotype just didn't sit well with me. And it also didn't facilitate meaningful conversations as well as just being Mark, being myself, and letting the universe bring those moments to me synchronistically, because you almost force it when you wear it on your sleeve like that, you know, and I think the universe is so much more subtle than that need to force things, you know, because as soon as I just started looking within and, and caring about what was going on within my outside got way better and I didn't need to wear crystals and I didn't need to you know dress a certain way because my reality actually changed and those real people were now vibrating on my wavelength and that's what I always wanted you know really is just to be on a different wavelength than those folks that were kind of weighing me down because like the idea that my family thinks I'm crazy it's like well yeah they're the crazy ones right but they're not, they're normal people. And I've spent a lot of time analyzing this. And the way I think of it is like, as a human being, we're put under so many different stresses. And we're also put under this, I mean, propaganda campaign, right? I mean, we know it well, because we have an open mind to this stuff. But those who get overwhelmed by the system and spend their life working in a job that takes away some of their freedom to have the critical thinking, right? Because if your mind is spent working on all these things, you might not have the mental capacity to, you know, just fantasize about all this stuff or, or think about or entertain it. And on top of that, the food that we're all eating is not nourishing our minds. It's not nourishing our souls. So we're all running on empty, doing the best we can. And as soon as I took the time to start smoking cannabis every day, drinking clean, fresh water, eating organic food. I think that facilitated a change in consciousness that the people in my family haven't had the opportunity to have. So it's unfair for me to, to say, oh, well, you guys are stupid because you don't think like me. No, that's not the case. It's just they aren't this far ahead on their path. This path might not even be something they're meant to go down 
So I just try to be a beacon of light and, you know, be myself. And if my family is interested in anything I have to share, they'll ask. So I don't want to force it on them. So, you know, this show title might give the impression that I'm like a lunatic and I'm like trying to force my family to believe in aliens or something. But really, it's just comes from a, a more of a place of wanting to be accepted. And I think a lot of people can relate to that, you know, so that's why I named my show that really. And it's true to who I am, you know, it, I think like I said, with, with being so fascinated with nature, I always saw that that was more real than the matrix that we're living in. You know, I just had a really fantastic person on my show, Michael Wan. I'd love to connect him with you because I think you guys would have a great conversation. But he was telling me about how we have like this, these three layers, you know, we have base level reality. That's the natural world that we're all in. We have this matrix on top of it, which is like all of the words, all of the things that we name in our naming consciousness. And then above that is everything and the, the, the lower the two meet and it all connects and permeates, you know, and I think as a mystic, you not only are rooted in that natural world, but you see straight through the matrix to the all. And that's what gives us this kind of complete feeling, this really great feeling, this oneness that other people who don't experience that, they sense it and they think, oh, well, that they, they're, they're really interesting. They're really spiritual. They're really, they're a hippie, you know, <laughs> because they can't quite put their finger on it. So they're using their naming consciousness to try to identify why you seem different. And really you're just in touch with them. You're in touch with the all, you know, and they, they just don't realize that they are too. They're just not actively in touch with it. Yeah. I love everything that you just said. And I love, I love the way you coughed your head while they're like, there's like, they seem really spiritual. They maybe they're a hippie. Like totally. That's totally it. Like, it's like, just, not being able to sense what spiritually connected people are able to sense. And so they kind of get caught in that naming consciousness of trying to understand it. And sometimes it's trying to understand it in a way that easily categorizes and dismisses it because they're so occupied, like you were saying, like it really isn't. I really appreciate you sharing that, that it's really not fair to other people who don't see the the matrix like the false overlay and the propaganda and all the things because totally it's created for the majority of us to not be able to see it it's a net that's created to trap most of us and we're you know very busy work life career life is very busy and and people don't have the time to critically think plus i think we ha are carrying around shit tons of trauma collectively personally individually collectively and examining those things deeply also invites us to start examining that trauma. And most people are just like, I don't have the time. I got to pay my bills. Like I just can't, I can't open that can of worms. And so I don't really want to hear about it, but they're kind of like, yeah, like what is, what's up with this person, this hippie or this flaky person is, it's kind of like, they're just trying to understand it. I also really like the way that you described it because Recently, I've started like seeing the matrix as a net. So it's like, it feels like a screen, but it's a screen with holes in it. And, and that's just it. Like some of us are able to see through that screen. It's not that we don't see the screen. It's that we see through it or connect through it into that, that other layer of the, the oneness. I think that's where we're all headed. I really do. I, I definitely think that there are some, some souls that are just on a journey, a trajectory, like you said, that maybe that's just not part of it for them at this time. And that's totally fine. But I think that more and more of us, the waking up process is because more and more of us are able to sense beyond that screen. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think when I say that, I mean, everybody comes to life, and you know this very well. I, I think this is something you talked about when you're on Tinfoil Hat. 
you make a decision to come into this body, you know, before, and you're in the spirit realm and you, you choose your parents and you choose your life. And we forget, you know, we come into this world and we forget that we made that choice. So yeah, I think it's quite possible that some people made that choice to forget and to be completely enveloped in this world. And maybe they're so fresh into it that, you know, someone who's lived many, many lives and has the Akashic record upgrades in their mind, you know, to have this recall of this stuff just seems completely foreign to them because they're just lower on the, the evolutionary path, you know, because we're all spiraling towards creation or away from creation. I think that's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. But as far as my personal trajectory, I think the reason why I was able to find this place now was because there was a lot of trauma. And for me, I had this big, big misconception that all drugs were bad, all drugs were evil. And I in no way want to endorse cannabis. I think everybody has their own personal decision to make whether or not they'll smoke. But for me, you know, using cannabis and using this medicine changed my life really deeply and gave the intuition to go and seek out these answers that I didn't know I was seeking. <laughs> they were just there. That feeling was there and I couldn't describe it. And I've always said it's it, it kind of wiped the slate clean for me to begin to look at the world and create a new perspective and kind of come out of that shell, that shell of all of the 16 years of growing up all of the like family misconceptions like my family gave me about the world and like all of the trauma of being where I am and all of the, you know, just the, the things that happen when growing up, when you're growing up, you know, I don't think suffering or trauma is to be avoided. I think it's just a part of being in this third dimensional reality and, and accepting that is how you, move forward and I don't think I would have been able to accept it without cannabis helping me in some way but I don't think that you need cannabis I think with the right set and setting you can do all of this completely sober I think it's just where we are now where I am now I needed that medicine to help fight this environmental pollution that's going on in our energy field in our environment in our food you know and even in our relationships there's a lot of psychological toxicity that's existed for a long time and i think i'm not one of these like social justice warrior people who are like oh you're toxic you're toxic you're toxic you know but i do think that the ego has been completely idolized in our culture. I think ego and emotions related to ego are really idolized and, and promoted. And I think that I've always reflected on that and tried to improve myself and avoid falling into those pitfalls. Because before cannabis, I just was, you know, blowing in the breeze. And I didn't really have that much direction. And anything that stuck to me was a part of me. And I think cannabis, like I said, wiped that slate clean and allowed me to look at the world and build a perspective, you know, rather than just being given a perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like create it deliberately, intentionally, um, mm. based on your own observation, rather than just the default of the way that you were programmed based on your circumstances. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's super cool. And so was that, was the decision to use cannabis the sort of catalyst of your spiritual awakening, would you say? Or was it something that you brought on board because you were starting to, or because you'd been experiencing a, a spiritual awakening and it felt kind of intuitively like the right thing to help you anchor into it? Well, I think martial arts 
pushed me into spirituality because at the time I just wanted to be myself, you know, and in school, I didn't understand quite how to be myself. And when I would get into conversations or arguments or fights, you know, that <laughs> didn't go my way, it would really be upsetting. You know, I would take it to heart and I, I really cared about how other people saw me. So I learned, I started learning martial arts because I realized that not all of the people that I was hanging out with had my best intentions in mind, you know? So yeah, I was, I, there were some fights I got into at a young age, 14, 15, just like fist fights behind school. And that kind of propelled me to want to not only defend myself, but have more confidence in myself. So I found Bruce Lee and I found, you know, martial arts and all these different styles, but you know, I emphasize Bruce Lee because his book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, I'm looking at it right now. I've had it for almost 12 years, and it really means a lot to me. The, the first two, three chapters are all about philosophy and Taoism. And, you know, <laughs> I, I thought I was just learning to beat people up. <laughs> you know, like that first, that's what it was. It was like, how do you beat people up? You know, how do you get good at, at not getting beat up? You know, yeah. And as I learned more about martial arts, I'm like, oh, wait, the best martial artist in the world, he's saying, first, you got to work on your mind and your soul, and then your body comes third. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. I've been doing that. I've been working on my mind. I've, you know, I think I've been working on my soul. I didn't really have much of a belief in God back then, but Taoism really kind of showed me that my appreciation for nature was an appreciation for God. And that connection really facilitated the growing of my spiritual awakening. At first, when I smoked cannabis, it was just a really great feeling. And then when I smoked by myself and the introspection and the reflection came in, that's when I realized it was spiritual. It was groundbreaking. It was paradigm shifting because I had been told by my culture that cannabis was a poison. It would make you stupid and slow and dumb. And I was on the wrestling team at that point, And I already done martial arts for a little while. And I thought, well, if this thing's not going to make me, you know, better at martial arts and it's not good for anybody, you know, but then I realized Bruce Lee was using marijuana. I looked it up. I, I, I looked, did some research and I, it was true. he, he took marijuana. He, you know, was eating it and smoking it as well. Back before, you know, most people did edibles, right? In the 1940s, I don't know how many people in the 1950s and 60s were doing edibles, but so yeah, Bruce Lee. And then of course, Eddie Bravo was another person who was like an amazing jujitsu guy and his YouTube videos were so popular. And then you see him like on Joe Rogan smoking a bong and you're like, whoa, this guy like changed the game for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and he smokes all the time, you know? And it's funny now for Sam, like Eddie Bravo is buddies with Sam. He's been on tinfoil hat. So the synchronicities are there for sure. I don't know how much Eddie would like to think that I was inspired by him to smoke <laughs> weed, but <laughs> Anyways, so so yeah, that really just opened my mind to it. They're like, oh, okay, these people are using it constructively. It's not a destructive thing. And that made me realize that society is more destructive, right? Because they're lying to me. They're going to war with other countries. And at that point, you know, with like a conservative grandfather and you know, talking to me about all this stuff going on in the news. I thought the Iraq war was fine. I'm like, oh, whatever, you know, those terrorists were bad guys. So, you know, like that's how naive I was about all these things. So it really opened my eyes to 9-11 because I witnessed it. I only live, you know, 50 miles away from New York City. We all like got kicked out of school that day and they wa made us watch it happen on the, the TV, you know, live. So a lot of events started to come into my mind like, oh, okay, the wars, the terrorist attacks, the politicians, the pollution, right? You had the BP oil spill, 
all of these things cannabis showed me like, Hey man, this is all bad. This is all happening because there are people in the world who aren't living with other people's best intentions in mind. And those people happen to be in control of a lot of shit, which is bad. You know, I mean, (laughs) it's bad. These people don't think from their heart. They think from their root chakra. If I can even give them that credit, in my opinion, I think all their chakras are probably calcified, but you know, these people like at the top, you know, unless they're using dark occult, (laughs) most of them I would imagine are not spiritually inclined, you know, they're just in these big powerful positions because they're greedy or they had family ties or whatever that gave them that position but we won't get too far into that. It's just cannabis made me realize like, Hey, there's bad things going on in the world, you know? And yeah, from there, it just started, the ball started rolling and where I fine tuned it all was when I first was gifted. A, I became friends with someone through my martial arts teacher, an older woman who uh, we, we didn't date or anything, but she was just really a great friend to me. And we connected over these spiritual books, right? One of them was the Carlos Castaneda, Don Juan, Yaqui Way, right? So I get this book, I start reading it, and I became friends with her. And she gave me these turquoise obsidian beads, right? They're not turquoise. They're just the color turquoise mm. obsidian. And the crystal had such an amazing effect on me from there, like, it was like time had forward and next thing I knew I had thousands of crystals. Like, <laughs> yeah. you, know, I like, <laughs> you know, like I had six turquoise obsidian bracelet and the next day, no, my room's full of, full of crystals. So that was like the, the hippie mark, new age mark, kind of, I started learning about all this stuff with energy. And then the reasons why society isn't so great started to make more sense, right? Because, oh, here are these natural energy sources. Here's an explanation for why I love being in nature, because it's pure, it emanates, it radiates this energy, just like a crystal. It's easy to understand that when you look at a crystal, you're like, wow, this is so beautiful. It's so profound. Obviously this thing's radiating energy, but when you look at a tree, it might not be that obvious, but it's the same thing, you know, and even with a living being, you know, whether it's a bug, an ant or a bird or, or a whale, you know, they're all emanating this energy and our society is so full of this dirty electricity and steel and plastic and all these different things that don't belong (laughs) around us. At least if they do, they need to be more thought out so that they're less harmful. But yeah, it's, it's contributing to the lack of spiritual inspiration, I think, in our culture. And I I started to realize that because here was this little alcove of crystals in this little shop in West Haven, Connecticut. And it's a very popular shop. I'm sure if anyone's listening from Connecticut, they've been there. (laughs) Shout out to Connecticut. But yeah, it's a it's a really cool little crystal shop, you know, and and of course, it's like witchy, you know, because it's New England. So they have all the witch stuff. And I'm not really into the paranormal like ghost type stuff even though that's like majority of what you'll find in new england when you come to a new england crystal shop it's like all like witch and werewolf and salem stuff but yeah i think that it just gave me this kind of like reassurance like hey there's already a whole community of people like you out there you know and i already had all these books that i've been collecting like so yeah, it's just been it's been a series of of synchronicities. I kind of feel like I, I lost track of my story, but when the crystals came into my life, I really felt like there was this new found ability. And here now I'm getting back on track. 
this newfound ability to channel information. When I say that, I don't want to sound like I'm like, uh, you know, Esther Hicks and like all that. No, I, I think what it is, is all of the books that I've collected and read started to really sit in my mind and channel through like, and my, thoughts were so much more informed than ever before and I really give crystals credit for that because when people at that age you know between the ages of 18 and like 23 when I would talk to people about this stuff they would re really be kind of impressed like oh wow you must know all this stuff you know like really well and I I would say kind of like well you know I just have faith in my mind's ability to connect to something higher than myself and I thought of it like my higher self, but as time went on, I started to liken it more to like an Akashic record, you know? And I think that these motifs and ideas and philosophies are all there in the ether. And when you align yourself and start to resonate with the natural human harmony what it means to be a human being to love yourself love the earth love your community you know i think then you can connect to that akashic record you know you can it's like the universe says all right you get it here take take some <laughs> take some wisdom you know and that's really what happened and i i think sometimes i would find myself sharing advice with somebody and it just came from a place of like, really it helped them, but it didn't come from like something I had experienced. It had come from like this other realm where I was saying something that I, I knew was right. It wasn't any doubt in my mind that what I was telling them was, was something that I believed in, but it just wasn't something I had put together beforehand, you know, like it wasn't like I thought about it one night, like, oh, and I'll say this and I'll say this, <laughs> you know, it just all flows so naturally. And I think in this past 10 years, we're all experiencing this, right? Flow state, consciousness, these are all terms that are way more available than they were when I was in high school, you know, like when I was in high school, the fact that I had like a totem every wrestling match <laughs> my coaches thought I was nuts but it worked because I was a captain of my wrestling team and it gave me a lot of confidence you know and I held that like totem that I got from uh, like some little kitschy shop and it was just like a jawbone and it had like a Native American kind of look to it like some you know somebody had made it and they were probably a first nations person so that was special to me you know and and it didn't matter if that jawbone had anything to do with wrestling it was the fact that like i got strength from it mm -hmm. helped my conscious environment you know it aided my conscious environment so but i'm, I'm going all over the place I, I feel like it's your turn to talk <laughs> I love, I love listening to all this. And I, I just feel like so much resonance with everything that you're saying, like the way that you were describing sort of accessing that flow state and just giving people a piece of advice or guidance or feedback or reflection or whatever that you could tell didn't really come from you. And you could tell that they were, you know, able to receive it is the way that I describe claircognizance. And I think a lot of people experience that more and more and we don't necessarily acknowledge it because we it's kind of comes really naturally or it's really easy to dismiss. But I, I love that you said, it's not that you're at home thinking this thought or, you know, off like it, in advance constructing this thought. Cause when people ask me like how, how do I know if it's my imagination versus something I'm receiving, like, you know, psychic information. That's the best way that I can describe it is like, okay, well feel yourself, think a thought and feel that it requires some effort to assemble it. And it's coming from your own biases and everything gets filtered through our biases. Anyway, it's impossible to totally remove them. But whereas when you access that, yeah, that Akashic field or that higher guidance, like a, like something that's flowing through you for the benefit of somebody else. And it's just using you as a, as a medium. It's like, you aren't assembling the thought. You're just 
allowing it to flow through and and you can't I often feel like well I really can't take credit for it because it didn't originate in my brain I just allowed it to come through and I'm getting better and better at allowing it in a cleaner way with more confidence in the fact that or like making it less about me like being less worried that it's going to be wrong and just letting it be what it is and be received the way it's received and yeah. All that. I think totally we were more and more people are gaining access to this. I think it's just, we've reached this like point of momentum where it's really speeding up a lot and it's almost effortless to tap into these things. All you have to do is have an openness and a curiosity and, and then it's just starts coming through. Yeah. And on that point of like knowing if you're wrong, right. So you feel this energy, you feel this method that's blooming, right? Because it's not unique to me. Everybody can experience this, right? Everybody can engage with the Akashic field. So the way I see it is like your brain is this amazing circuit board. And every time, like an organic circuit board, let's be real with it, because I don't want to Yes, yes, totally. As a man made anything, but it's this organic circuit board. And every time you open up one pathway, like a thought about something, that opens up another pathway from source, right? So you're building this network in your mind of all these different pathways that source can channel information through you. You know, so that's why it's important to never stop striving to learn new things because you're not learning new things. You're remembering things that your mind had forgotten because, you know, I don't really subscribe to this theory. Like we only use 10% of our brain. I think that's BS. You know, like how would we even know that? Who said that? <laughs> exactly. But if you're going to go with that, let's just say that there was a state of humanity where we were a hundred percent. Right. Yeah. And whatever happened, the fall, if you believe in that now we're where we are now, we're in this state where there's a manipulation of our energy field. There's a manipulation of our cultural matrix and there's a manipulation of our heart source. Right. Because there's always when empire gets involved, they say, well, we're the middleman between your heart source and God. So like, that's fine and all, but don't talk to God unless it's through us. Right. That's pretty much what always happens with, with empire. So I think once you start to recognize all these things, you build back towards what we used to be, you know, which was this enlightened human race. I think that human beings just need to be in the right environment you know we need to create the environment so we can thrive that we will thrive in and that's really how we're being stopped is our environment physically mentally yeah. and spiritually is being manipulated you know yeah. I, I i agree with you completely i it's really interesting i'm doing so everybody on the podcast is going to be like, oh, this program that you're doing, because I keep mentioning it, but it's fascinating because it's, it's coming up like it's, so I'm, I'm running this program called the priestess portal, which is uh, channeling these transmissions about the divine feminine, divine masculine blueprint, but from the perspective of the divine feminine. And it's, it's mind-blowingly beautiful and powerful. It's stuff that my human brain didn't know. So it's all new information for me. And it keeps getting validated in the conversations that I'm having that like we, we have this blueprint and it's been corrupted along the way. But by corrupted, I mean, it has been exposed to various angles of damage. But it at the same time, it's permanently whole. Like we just get to disengage from that program that, you know, like, it's like we get to unsubscribe, like, nope, I don't buy into this anymore. It's a mind program. Even the stuff that is happening to us physically, our physical bodies belong to us. It's a sovereign thing. They're ours. It's our energy. So when our mind becomes powerful enough to reject the program and just unsubscribe, then our body also gets to be released of all the toxins and all the, you know, calcification and all that stuff. 
but what I keep seeing is like human beings are so beautiful and divine and powerful and you know like we're just living as a little shadow of what we truly can be but that's where we're moving back towards and you know all we just re received so much gaslighting like you, basically we we take on because we receive this programming that we are to blame for all of the terrible things in the world. like humans are just garbage people we're a garbage species we war with each other we hurt each other we pollute our environment we overpopulate we use too many resources blah 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 but from my perspective none of that's true when human beings live in accordance with our true blueprint we are in beautiful beautiful integrated harmony with this incredible planet that we're on and <laughs> It's actually industry who is funded by those people with all the calcified, you know, chakras that are not operating from the heart center. It's industry that creates the plastics and the pollutant chemicals. And like, I don't want to go to the grocery store and buy crackers for my daughter and have like five crackers come individually cellophane wrapped. That's not what I desire to do that. I would like to you know, but then our time is monopolized so that we can't all make our own crackers. And it, it's just, we're in this system that's been created for us. The system that pits us all against each other, the system created patriarchy, which hurts men and women together because we are all in this together. It's not men hurting women. It's like men and women are being hurt and being pitted against each other. All the races are being pitted against each other. There's just so many ways we receive this bogus programming. And then we're gaslighted to believe that it's just because we suck and, yeah. and we should be ashamed of ourselves as humans. But the human potential is absolutely like, it blows my mind. And I know I'm only re still receiving the tip of the iceberg because my human consciousness <laughs> as it is right now, can't fully comprehend how magnificent we are. Yeah. And, you know, at the beginning, we kind of touched on like, well, it's not fair to hold this ignorance against our families if they don't understand our enlightenment because the matrix is against them, right? The matrix yeah. against them. So we can we apply that same compassion to this so-called 1%, this so-called industry oligarchy, right? If you were in those shoes would you be that greedy you know would you be that disconnected from your heart center i think it's like you know we all as a human race set this parade in motion and the people at the parade are all going in the same direction marching at the same speed but some of us are at the front with all the nice stuff and the big floats and the fancy costumes. And the rest of us are in the back where there's sweat and horse poop and all the, yeah, other all the garbage, all, the, all <laughs> yeah. the things that the people in the front are throwing back behind them as they're parading, you know, and yeah. if you're in front of the parade, why would you move to the back? You know, yeah. like these people are born at the front of the parade. They don't, Con they don't consider what's going on behind them because they're making all of these decisions based on how to keep this parade moving at the speed and the, you know, grandness that it's already at. So they want to control the gold. They want to control the minerals. They want to control the water. They want to control all these things because they've put themselves at the front of the parade they're not guiding themselves they're not guiding all of us from yeah. their heart you know so i think it's going to take the whole parade to have to stop i think you know they kind of did a fake version of that with this pandemic you know without getting too much into all of that but i think really what it what the hippie generation kind of did in the 60s right where they were like we're done living in the suburbs we're going to go make communes they effectively stopped the parade. They said, we're not going to follow the parade. We're going to go make our own parade. And that can lead to problems too, because, you know, but I think that's ultimately what needs to happen is we all need to disengage from this 
system as much as we can until that parade becomes just the front and there and nobody cares and they're just wandering off <laughs> they're just they're, walking along and they're just going off yeah that's uh, they out and no one sees them again you know? and that's, yeah exactly that's they're, they're welcome to keep going if they want we've created this whole other awesome thing over here and with their and with their paradigm that they're creating they might just do that with elon musk's spaceship right because they're going to create this false notion that the earth can't support them anymore so they just need to go and find a new planet and good riddance get lost like let us let the earth grow and re-green you know because yeah. it's we're not going to need elon musk to do that the people of the of the earth the majority of the people of the earth are already living as close to the land as possible right the poorest people yes are living in literal dirt huts yeah. and they're literally building their houses out of the trash that flows down the river from the rich people's communities. I mean, literally, we don't have that as much in the United States until you maybe go to some of these homeless tents and, you know, it's, it's awful. But then like you go down to, you know, right below the border in Mexico, that Tijuana, that people are literally living in boxes, houses made out of boxes. So, and in India too, and you know, so in China, I'm sure, but either way, the point is, is that so many of us are already that close that we can make that change. You know, we just need to give those people an option to <laughs> recycle goodness back into the earth. Cause what are they given? They're given junk, plastic, garbage, and they're we're humans. We're striving to, we're always striving to survive. So they're taking what they have available to them, making the most of it. Mm -hmm. Imagine if all of these industries stopped creating plastics and started doing renewable resources and biodegradable resources. And these products actually had more value. And then those people can go back to getting value from their surroundings because they wouldn't be dependent on these big corporations who roll into their country and say, Oh yeah, forget your jobs. Come work for us. You know, don't the, the river's polluted anyways, you can't fish anymore. So you gotta, you know, work for pennies building iPhone batteries. I mean, think about it. If we stop that system, all of those people who are living in poverty because of industry can go back to, living as stewards of the land, mm -hmm. which is what we're all supposed to be, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And, and I agree that like the ultimate thing, or it feels for me anyways, for me, I always keep having to come back to that way of understanding how those people at the front of the parade are not inferior to me morally because you know because I think it's such a dangerous ego trap that we get on that we're kind of seeing run rampant and out of control right now of the belief that like because of the way that I choose to live or the choices that I make or because I don't do these things I'm better than but that then takes us further away from the unity consciousness that will I believe is the direction that we're being called towards and that will allow all that healing to take place and all of that transformation of our society to take place. And I know not everybody's there and there are certain things that I struggle with a lot, but ultimately I also, yeah, I try to like run that exercise of being like, well, how is it that they are like this? And how is it that like, if I was in their position I very well could be making the exact same choices and that I just wasn't born into that. And that wasn't, that's not my trajectory in this life, but that doesn't make me better as a soul. And, and I, I don't know. I just offer that out because I think sometimes in the conversations that I hear around it, we can get really stuck on pointing the finger at the evil bad guy. And they definitely are doing really evil, evil things. But as long as we're stuck pointing the finger then we, it's just another way that we leak our power and our agency to create transformation from within. Yeah, yeah. I think w the only thing that you can do with darkness is shine light on it, you know, and, and, and being ignorant of all these things is mostly why 
we don't know what's going on. I think most people just like we talked, touched on earlier are so busy trying to keep up with the parade that they don't know what's going on at the front of the parade. They don't know why they're heading in this direction. They don't know why their environment's slowly getting worse and worse. And I honestly don't think that our earth is as fragile as we're being told. I think our you know, Mother Earth is extremely strong and can chew us up and spit us out if she wanted to. Yeah. So I do think that, you know, if we all just gave like, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but at the beginning of last year or, or a year ago, right, last spring, COVID happened and less cars were on the road, less people were moving around. And I heard more birds chirping. I saw more birds. I saw more bugs. I saw more mice. I saw, I saw so many rabbits, so yeah. many rabbits here. So just that small amount of time yeah. of people staying out of off the road, literally just off the road, gave the earth that much breathing room to like give that much back. So imagine if we took like, more steps to disengage from this industrial mechanism that we're all kind of participating in. You know, unfortunately, the parade is really tantalizing, you know, because nobody wants to get left behind. But we can start our own parade going in a better direction, you know, and that I think this parade metaphor is running itself a little <laughs> far now, but you get what I'm saying. Totally, totally. And I agree. And it's really interesting. I feel like so many people are intuitively like wherever they are on their journey, whether they feel spiritual or like aware of conspiracies or even just afraid about the, the mainstream narrative. I feel like a lot of people I hear in conversation are being guided towards that they want to you know reconnect with the earth they want to reconnect with the process of growing their own food last year yeast and so of course toilet paper was hard to come by but the next things that were like impossible to come by were yeast and flour because everybody was like well I guess it just makes sense to start making my own bread products again and I started my own sourdough this year and it was great and like just even that like creating those reconnections with the process of making food and just settling more deeply into that and not eating out as much and that kind of stuff I feel like we're just being naturally called toward that and it's the direction to go the more that we connect with our humanness as being inherently integrated with like biological life on earth the more we I don't know we begin those healing processes and disconnect from that direction that we've we've been going absolutely yeah so I think the best I can do now is to advise people to get out into nature and right as soon as you can, I mean, support your local farmers because that's how you disengage from the system. It starts with our, our food, our diet. I think industry really its invasion into taking over our lives happened in three ways. The modernization of clothing, which was probably one of the first, then food and now entertainment, right? Cause that's so pervasive, but that's always been going on. They've always been trying to entertain people and to shape their reality based on what entertains them. But I think food is the first thing. So like you go to your farmer's markets, you go to those farm stands because not all farmers markets are great. Right. Trust me. I worked at one for five years and now they're making everybody wear a mask. So don't go to the New Haven farmers market. <laughs> but the farmers there are great people and you can go straight to their farm and support them instead of going to the farmers market. And that's my point. So wear a mask just long enough to meet the farmer, find out where they're located and, and support your farms directly, because that's how you disengage from that part of it. And then, I mean, buying sourced clothing is getting easier and easier as time goes on. I think more companies are, are doing that. And that's a big deal because so many countries have been destroyed 
by our industries going there, yeah. building unfair things. And, and so start with that, you know, support companies that are fair trade, that are not, you know, polluting and all that, which is hard. You got to do some research, but I'm planning on uh, making an episode of my show where we, we give people like a buyer's guide, like just like where to go. But, and then the last one is entertainment, right? So if you're listening to this podcast, you're already there, you know, start supporting this kind of entertainment and sharing it with your friends so that we all start engaging with podcasts and things that fulfill us rather than TV shows and movies and radio music. Like it's all that same, like really weak energy, right? Where they're trying to project weakness onto all of us and ego and, you know, I think that's, that's really what I would say to, to be solution based, you know, the end of my dissertation here. (laughs) (laughs) That was a great dissertation. I totally loved it. And I'm looking forward to that podcast episode of just like, you know, some of those options fleshed out for, for listeners. I think that's really cool. So again, everyone, it's a, it's the, my family thinks I'm crazy podcast and all of Mark's you know, contact things are in the show notes, his website, his Patreon, his Instagram. Mark, thank you so much for being here and having this beautiful, beautiful conversation. We didn't even get into your third eye. So basically you're just going to have to come on again so that we can talk about that. And I just feel like there's a ton, a ton more that we could have rambled on about. And and that was my friend. My friend wanted to ask you a question, but she never sent it to me, my lady friend. So okay. Shout out to shout out to Taylor. Maybe we can have you on my show, and Taylor will be the co-host. Oh yeah, I'd love that. I'd totally Um, love that. That would be that would be something to look forward to. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for your, you know, your beautiful attention. I say this every time, but I mean it so sincerely that I know that there's so many things that you could be listening to and doing with your time and and your attention. And I appreciate you sharing it with us on this episode. If you enjoyed it and you want to give us a little bit of love, you can screenshot yourself listening to it and tag us on Instagram and your Instagram stories or something like that. But either way... Well, speaking for myself, I just love you. I'm sure Mark appreciates you as well. (laughs) And I hope you all have a beautiful day or night wherever you are. I'll catch you on the next episode, guys. Hello, beautiful soul. Thank you so much for listening to Third Eye Awakening. If you love the show and you want to show me some support as well as get some rich and awesome extra content, then you can support me through Rockfin or Patreon. It really goes a long way to help me create Third Eye Awakening and keep it free for everyone and ad free because isn't that nice? Isn't it so nice to listen to a podcast without any ads on it? I feel like it is. No shade to anybody who puts ads on their podcast, but I just love creating content and I love having ad free content. So in order to do that, I've created a Rockfin account and a Patreon account with all kinds of juicy conversations and solo rants and riffs and sort of trainings on spiritual topics, metaphysical topics, just cool shit to anchor in some of that multidimensional light consciousness and expand your mind. Thank you always so much, whether you choose to support or not. It just means the world to me to have you listening to this podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me on this episode. I appreciate you more than my words could ever say. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, and share, and I will catch you on the next episode.